I'm Sam Yahuri. I was born in Jaffa, in Palestine, in 1933. On November 24, I will be 75 years old. Alhamdulillah. But most of my uh, life was actually in, in a boarding school. I mean, my school days were from age five, I went to Birzit uh, uh, College. Uh, it was a high school and um, a co-educational school, but we were boarders there. It's a school that was founded by my family, my aunt. And so we, we went there until I graduated from high school. And then uh, I went, uh, but we were living in different parts of Palestine. I mean, we lived in, uh, we were born in Jaffa, but then we lived in Ramle, we lived in Nazareth, actually, we lived in Safad in Nablus. My father was a civil servant, so he moved different places. So the last place we were living in was in Jerusalem before 48, and uh, my parents left the home. We were already in boarding school, so they came over, and the rest of our life we stayed in Birzeit until I got married in 1960 and moved back to Jerusalem. It was fun being in boarding school. I mean, it was difficult. It wasn't easy life, you know. It was uh, the, the hardships of, uh, of uh, being in a boarding school with no heating, with limited water. Uh, Palestine has always been known for uh, shortage of water. And Birze especially, there were, uh, we had to, uh, the drinking water had to be fetched from the spring. And uh, so we didn't have uh, ample water to take daily showers. It was uh, once a week we would take a bath, and every day we just go down and sneak to the kitchen and, and take, bring some hot water from the kitchen. They had these cast iron uh, stoves where they put the water so that it would be boiling by the morning for the tea or coffee. And so we'd sneak and get some uh, hot water to wash a little bit before going to sleep. Uh, but it was fun. There were girls in the dorms from all over Palestine. They came from different parts of Palestine. And it was a uh, nice comradeship. Uh, and it taught us uh, to be independent. And there was always a chance for developing uh, your character. We had such nice social evenings in the evening. We'd have drama, we'd have dancing. I mean, it, it, it really uh, gave us a lot of extracurricular uh, activities when we were in school. Actually, my father had a lot of vision and he, he was worried. We had a big lot of land in Jerusalem that my aunt wanted to move the school to it from Birzeit. The, the, the whole idea of starting the school in Birzeit was to teach. There was no education in the neighborhood there, for girls especially. And she started the school there so that uh, it, she would provide education for the girls of the villages of Birzeit and the surrounding villages. And then automatically the boys said, well, we want to go to school. So she, it became a co-educational school. And then they bought this land hoping to move the school or to have another school in, uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, every year my aunt would tell my father, when are we going to build in Jerusalem? And he'd tell her, the situation doesn't look well. Let's take our time. Let's take our time. And uh, he was so right. I mean, when... Um, when the Israeli underground, or the Jewish, it wasn't Israeli at the time, the Jewish underground actually started blasting uh, buildings and so on. Uh, the King David Hotel was a, a really very scary event. My father was at the doorstep of the building coming to visit uh, uh, the man who took over from uh, his uh, job. He had resigned and he was coming over to hand over to him. And then he reached the doorstep of King David Hotel and looked at his watch and he said, it's too early now. I'm going to come and have lunch at the YMCA anyway. So I'll go do some other errands and then come back, see this man and, and then go to the YMCA. Just as soon as he left, he hardly got away, a kilometer away and the building was gone. And to us, I mean, my mother, 
came to us. We were taking a nap in the afternoon in summer at Trulais. And she said, go on your knees. Go on your knees and thank the Lord that your father was spared. We, we didn't know that he was even going to Jerusalem for that. We were spending the summer in, in Brazil. We used to go that always, even during the summer, we'd go for a month during the grapes and, uh, and the fig season and uh, spend some time there. So we really realized that things are getting very, very serious. And we were very, very worried until then the moment when, uh, when the Yassin massacre took place and then people started being uh, uh, scared to death because uh, the, the Jewish underground were going around uh, in the trucks uh, showing some of the people who, who were killed in the massacre to tell the people, if you don't go, your fate will be likewise, you know. And so people started leaving Jerusalem, and it was scary. Now we were sitting in Birzeit one afternoon, and then I watched the people of Ramble and Linda coming, walking all the way from Ramble. It was such a sad, sad sight and very, very distressing. And my aunt opened the storeroom, whatever we had, whatever was there, we just started boiling eggs, boiling potatoes, making salad and whatever. And they came just so, so exhausted. Some of them were even not coherent because uh, they were walking all, the, all day long. And it was a very, very traumatic experience, a sight that I'll, I'll never forget. I mean, so... And then things never were the same again for us as Palestinians. It all started, and, uh, and then my father thought, with all these refugees that came in, he felt he had to do something about document them. So he rallied all of us, the young people in the town, and we started, and we, we started making uh, like a census of all these people, the number of families that came and the villages that they came from. And he handed these when the Red Cross came in and he handed them and they were very, very grateful for that information because it was really documented. UNRWA was not even yet there. And they even uh, decorated him for uh, this big job that he did. It was something that uh, was worthwhile. And it, it gave all of us, uh, I mean, the, the whole young people of the town, it gave us a, a purpose of, uh, because we all felt that eventually, I mean, they're going to go back. So we, we needed this documentation to, to know who came and from which areas and so on, unfortunately. But many of these people really settled eventually in the Ramallah area. I mean, nobody felt that this was a fair, uh, fair uh, deal. Because we were the majority of the people, and then the, the, the partition scheme gave them the majority of the land, and it was not fair. And we never wanted to be partitioned. We didn't see any reason why there should be a state for the Jews and a state for the Arabs. I mean, we were all Palestinians. We lived together. At the time when we lived in Safad, we had Jewish neighbors, and we, we lived very, uh, very peacefully uh, with each other. And uh, we had neighbors, Jewish neighbors, we had Muslim neighbors, we had Christian neighbors, and I mean, we were all Palestinians. We were all Palestinians, I mean, to us, whether irrespective of the, the faith. I mean, personally, I didn't see, uh, other than the King David incident, but we have, I mean, we've seen, we've seen many people uh, suffering uh, and they have, they were very, they became very vicious and they were uh, attacking quarters and uh, making it uh, difficult for people and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, bombing different areas and having small massacres here and there so that people are scared and playing. And then, of course, they used psychologically, they'd go around. I mean, not only in Jerusalem. They went around in different areas, scaring people to, to pack and, and leave in different areas. And, 
And the human beings, I mean, are the, the first thing you worry about is your family. You know, people just carried their children and, and ran away. People on the coastal line mostly went to Lebanon and Alexandria. And the people in, uh, in the center, like Ramleh and Lid and all that, they came walking to, to the hilly areas. So we ended up with refugees in Palestine itself, uh, in the areas that were not, uh, that did not become part of uh, Israel. And some went across the, uh, the, the bridge to Jordan. And then, of course, to Syria and Lebanon. Uh, so we've had uh, the, the worst, really, uh, the situation in, in Lebanon and, and Syria. The refugee camps are uh, very crowded, and uh, they're not uh, in, in good condition at all. Uh, I was, uh, they came into the neighborhood where my aunt was uh, living and my husband's family. Of course, I didn't know him then, but they, he, he told me that uh, they did, actually. But I was in, in Birzit, I was in, in boarding school, so I did not personally, I cannot, I mean, uh, say I, I heard them. But I was told by people who I know were telling me exactly what had happened. They were saying that uh, if you don't leave, I mean, if you don't leave, your, your fate will be like the people who were massacred in their scene. This is for Jerusalem area. And they'd say, if you don't go, you're, you will, uh, in, in other areas where they, they mass had small massacres, Many of them we really had not heard of until Ilan Pape's book came out and uh, the ethnic cleansing. And uh, these very, very small towns where things were happening, many of the people, uh, the Palestinians themselves didn't even know about. But the archives were available to him now after so many years. And he was able to document lots of the things that they were really pushing them out before even, uh, before the war started. So many people uh, were uh, had to be evicted under uh, under threat, or they were scared. Many people, I mean, were scared, but m many others were really evicted. Like if, uh, you heard Reverend Ati speak today that he is a refugee if, uh, uh, internally. I mean, they evicted them from Bissan to Nazareth. So it stayed, both towns are in, uh, in what became Israel, and they would not allow them to go back to their town. It's, it's, it's such a grave injustice, and that is really uh, what, what hurts you. It's a grave injustice that has not been at all attended to and taken care of. And uh, despite the resolutions of the United Nations, they have not implemented one single resolution concerning uh, the, uh, the rights of the Palestinians since the establishment of the, uh, the State of Israel. I mean, the, uh, regarding the refugees, they were supposed to go back. All refugees, I mean, international law, no matter where, what the reason of their leaving, ha gives them the right to go back to their town. Of course, Israel does not allow this and did not allow it and will continue not allowing it unless it is forced to, to do so. Emotionally, I think, I mean, we were, we were very, very, uh, we were shocked to see these, these uh, floods of people, sort of. I mean, waves and waves. I was sitting in my room up on a second floor uh, we couldn't believe we had to run down and, and see what was happening. And so we went out and, and met them and opened our doors. Uh, everybody, I mean, uh, the school, the, the, the church opened their doors and the, uh, the convents opened, the convent, the Catholic convent also opened their door to receive them. It was a human tragedy, a real human tragedy. And luckily, it was still warm in, in summer, and they squatted under the olive trees. And then we used to go, and uh, we had a nurse uh, coming to help out. And in the evenings, we'd help her with the first aid stuff, with the cut goals, cotton, and bandages, and go visit with her. And uh, see, the children, many of them were dehydrated, and they had to be taken care of. It was really a very, very traumatic experience. 
and a true uh, human uh, tragedy. Only lately I, I read a testimony by uh, a doctor. He was uh, writing about it, and he said, my father was received in Birzeit by, he, he was a, one of the families who came walking, and he was telling me, uh, he was writing about it, I was reading it. I said, I never realized you were amongst those. So he mentioned that Birzeit school opened their doors for them. So it was, um, it's very, very sad. Now, many of them, actually, there were people who told us that uh, some died on the roads, of course, and some of them even, uh, the children died on the roads, and they, they, they couldn't cope with the, with the walk. Well, <clears throat> so many of the families, I mean, uh, dispersed. I mean, not one family stayed in their places, and uh, many of the people uh, <clears throat> ended up, uh, those who went to Lebanon and, and Syria, Cairo, Alexandria, Jordan, and uh, so on. And, and many, eventually, those who had young people who went out to study, the, many of them did not uh, come back at the time. Now, after, after 48, uh, they, we've had uh, this, uh, and between 48 and 1967, we became part of Jordan. Jordan annexed uh, the Palestinian territories that did not become uh, Israel. It was the idea that they would annex it until a solution, a just solution, will uh, uh, come about for the Palestine question. So life was reasonably all right during the during the Jordan uh, times. Uh, of course, I mean. Uh, there were lots of politics that we did not approve of. <laughs> and, uh, but the everyday living, at least. Uh, you could go anywhere, you had a passport, you know, and you could uh, travel wherever you want. Uh, there were times where there were military rule during the Jordan times. Uh, there were parties that were not happy with the performance of the king and so on. These, there were quite a bit of these uh, things. But on the whole, I mean, uh, people could live fairly a normal life until 1967, and then hell broke loose. Even in 67, when the, when the occupation took place, at the beginning, it, the shock of the occupation was, uh, nobody believed, I mean, uh, that it, uh, the new reality uh, overnight. I mean, you were, you were, we were at a wedding the day before, celebrating and enjoying reception and so on, and the next morning we were already under occupation. I mean, they say six day war, but actually the Israelis were all over the place and the next day. I mean, Jerusalem was, there was no resistance whatsoever. During the Jordan times, you could not even carry a pistol. I mean, you could, nobody had arms. I mean, if the old city, if people had arms, at least there would have been some resistance. But nobody was allowed. It's just, uh, you could go to jail uh, for that. And uh, people, some people had only, uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, weapons that they used for hunting. Uh, that's, that's all. And uh, so a new reality came about, which was a great shock for everybody. But nobody believed that it will last, except, of course, the United Nations took a resolution immediately to end, to, to force Israelis to evict the areas that they uh, occupied. But here we are. <laughs> from 67 to 208, and we're still under occupation. And it became worse and worse. I remember we had visitors from the Galilee who came to visit in Ramallah. And they told us, you're still in the honeymoon period. They've gone through all this themselves in 48. And uh, they had their lands confiscated. They had to have permits to travel. You heard one of the speakers today said in 66 only they, 
they were able to have access to different towns. They used to, from like Nazareth to Jerusalem, they needed a permit, from Jerusalem to Haifa or something like that. And uh, eventually, uh, it tightened up. You, we, had, we could travel everywhere. I mean, it's, it was ironical that I had to see our home in Jerusalem due to the occupation. I mean, in 48, we, we left and uh, we didn't see it. In 67, the borders were open, so we were able to drive and go and see our home. But it was, it was very sad under these circumstances to see it. I mean, you were hoping to go back to it when you're really liberated and uh, have a country of your own. So, and then the brutality of the Israeli army started getting worse and worse, and the animosity became more and more, and uh, there hasn't been one family that was not touched by this occupation, whether imprisonment, whether deportation, whether assassination. I mean, it has become very, very difficult. And then this glimpse of hope came about when they said there's going to be a peace and they evacuated the, the Palestinian territories. And the people were so happy, they threw roses at them, and they truly believed there was going to be a peace process. Now, the Palestinians were split. Some of them didn't believe at all that this is because nobody really knew what the, what the elements and what the... Uh, the uh, what it was all about, I mean, the, the, um, it was so unclear. Of course, they said Jerusalem, the refugees, all these big issues were in the later stages. And that's why some people were not at all comfortable about this peace process. And truly, it turned out that the, those of us who did not have much faith in this peace process, we turned out to be correct. Because ever since that day, we've been accommodating, accommodating continuously, continuously to the Israelis. And the more, the more uh, negotiations take place, the more you lost uh, land, the more settlements uh, were developed, the more. The new realities that they keep creating on the ground has complicated things much, much more. And every time there is a new issue, at the beginning it was annexation of Jerusalem, and then it was the settlements, and then it was the wall, and, and, now, and then eventually development of the settlements. And they say the illegal settlements, to remove the illegal, as if any of them is legal. All the settlements are illegal. So it, the reality on the ground was the idea of the peace that Israel wants. It's creating reality. Nobody's going to force them to get out of the occupied territory. The United Nations has become absolutely impotent due to the, uh, the USA policy. Unfortunately, it has hijacked the role of the United Nations, and it has no backbone at all to come up and say, enough is enough. There are many resolutions. You have to abide by them or else. Nobody tells Israel or else, you know. No, no language of sanctions or, uh, or boycott or anything is, is, uh, is uh, mentioned as far as Israel is concerned, as if they are above the law and they get away with all the violations of human rights by all the measures that are uh, against international law. Unfortunately, this is where we are now, and we don't see at all. I mean, Mr. Bush used to say that before his term is over, he's definitely going to find a solution. Well, we've had seen presidents come and go and even now with President Obama, of course, it's a new change, definitely a change. But for us, we're not hopeful until we see it. I mean, we stopped being really, not that I am pessimistic myself. I am very optimistic. If I am not optimistic, I wouldn't even be coming to this conference or wouldn't be talking to you 
because we feel, I mean, because we feel justice is on our side. And when you have a just cause, you just don't give up. And you keep working towards justice and you keep hoping that eventually justice will prevail and uh, the outcome of uh, will be uh, hopefully a just peace. Otherwise, this would go on and on and on, and it is not good, neither for the Palestinians nor for the Israelis. It is dehumanizing both of us just as much. I mean, thank God for these soldiers who refuse to serve in, uh, in the occupied territories now. There are a group of them, but they're not enough to make a dent. This is the problem, I mean. But we need... We need voices, we need action. I mean, it's not enough. And if we're going to wait to educate the millions of people, it's, it'll be catastrophic. I don't think I'll, definitely I will not see it in my lifetime. And hopefully you will be able to see it. I, my, my father used to say, I'll be lucky if my grandchildren see it. Well, hopefully I have a two-year-old grandson and a 20-year-old son, a grandson. So maybe, inshallah, we say <laughs> it is it is people who gave it is people who didn't have the land gave it to other people i mean this is this is in a in a in a nutshell i mean it is giving people something that didn't belong to them and the 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 whole idea that uh, they found a solution for the jewish problem to give them a land that had no people, I mean, a people f without land for a people. Well, it, it went like this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got it mixed up. A people without land for a land without people. Okay, so they wanted to give the Jews a land without, because they didn't have land. But the problem is that the land they gave them had people. It was inhabited by Palestinians for thousands of years. And it was not fair. They, they wanted to solve a problem, but they created another problem. And you don't, uh, you don't solve injustice by bringing about another injustice. And this is why we're saying now, we're talking about relative justice. Because if we want 100% justice, Israel has to go. But we're saying, we're accommodating. We're saying we want a state alongside the state of Israel, or one state for all the people. I mean, the ideal situation is one state like before 48. But Israel is the one who says, no, I want a Jewish state. Even that is a dilemma for them, as you heard this afternoon in the program. It needs, I mean, how can you be a Jewish state when you already have around 20% of your people non-Jews? And the mere fact when you say a Jewish state means that you don't have the same rights for people who are not Jews. So it's just as much a dilemma for them. So the sooner really this occupation comes to an end, the sooner more people's lives are spared and everybody lives happily ever after <laughs> the end of the story. <laughs> uh, I think the Americans, you say they don't know, but I feel because because their government or their administration, I mean, interferes in the fates of people all over the world, they have to know. I mean, I, I'm not supposed to know what's happening in, in Congo or Sudan or something. I'm not even paying a penny there or I'm not doing anything about it. But when they are so supportive of the state of Israel, when the tax money goes to Israel, it is maintaining the prisons where the Palestinians are. I mean, every prisoner is costing the American government, not Israel. And Israel could not have maintained this occupying, occupation without the support of Israel, uh, the United States, whether morally or financially. So because of that, the American public have to know. They have to know what their government is doing. Because I'm sure once they know they're not happy. And we've seen that. I mean, we've seen people, genuine people, genuine and good people, who really, when you know the truth, you're really stuck with the truth. 
and you cannot but react in a, in a different way. But then we cannot count on the millions of people. We cannot wait to count on them. The people who have the say and the power, they know the truth, and they have to act likewise. I mean, they have to take uh, a very, very firm stand and put an end to this occupation. That's our only hope.